토끼쯤 해요 What are you waiting for? Open it up! Okay, so this is easily the craziest lock I own. Before I go too far into it, I want to say that everything I know about this lock comes from Michael Hebler's excellent tool paper. Uh, and I'll go ahead and link to that down below. So this lock is the Fichette Le Fichette F3D. It is absolutely huge. And it's what's known, uh, I guess, in, in France as a pump lock or, or a push lock in that it's, uh, its action is essentially a push-in type action. Here is... Let's see, here is the lock in comparison to a standard mortise. This is an acetwin mortise cylinder. So it's a it's massive, massive lock. And then the keys themselves are huge too. I think they're 99 millimeters. And there's a key in comparison to an acetwin key, which itself is a large key. Now this isn't a lock that I have any intention of picking. Um, and that's for a couple of reasons. First off, they're very hard to come by outside of France. Uh, secondly, they're very expensive. And thirdly, I just wouldn't want to risk damaging it. It's a very complicated locking mechanism, and I, I feel like doing too much picking on it could actually damage it. So. This uh, cylinder here, which Fichette calls a monoblock, and it interfaces with a proprietary mount that, that's also made by Fichette uh, that goes in the doors. So this isn't, you know, Obviously, by looking at it, you can tell it's not compatible with any Euro cylinders or anything like that. It's a very specifically Fichette thing. Although, uh, interestingly, they are owned by Asa Abloy. And probably the most interesting thing about this lock is the key, which looks like something that might open an alien spaceship. So the keys have these little plastic sheaths on them, which obviously can be removed. Um, and then you see a uh, mildly skeletonized component uh, b below. The three-dimensional shape we can start to see milled into the uh, key itself. And then we have a corresponding groove in the top. Come in for a little bit more of a close-up. You can see more detail on the groove in the top. And then the triangular shape, three-dimensional mil milling. Uh, the tip here is triangular, uh, triangular shape, like the key. And that corresponds to the little discs inside the, um, the lock core itself. These areas here, these cutouts are for uh, key retaining pins. And so that uh, mechanism actually, the lock mechanism puts pins down into here to prevent you from pulling the key out during operation. This heavier duty side with um, the brass and the warding in here is for the outside of the door. And this smaller, uh, shorter, and unwarded side is for the in, in, internal side of the door. This is actually just a very thin piece of metal that comes off uh, relatively easily um, and just kind of covers that up. Okay, for this next part, we're gonna dive pretty heavily into the graphics that Michael Hubler put into his uh, really, really awesome paper. I was actually able to get permission from him to use these images. And Michael, thank you very much for that. I really appreciate it. Okay, going through the anatomy of this lock, like I said, I'm not going to gut it. As far as I can tell, these pins hold uh, hold the whole lock together, and I cannot come up with a way to get them out non-destructively. But luckily, Michael has gutted his, um, and so we're going to be able to use those images to show how it works inside. So going through the anatomy of the lock, top to bottom, we have six tumblers with a triangular-shaped inside cutout, which corresponds to the triangular-shaped key. 12 gears, which are two per tumbler, two brackets, front and back piece, the front piece containing key retaining pins. Then we have 12 gear racks, which correspond to the gears, uh, which then correspond to the tumblers. This graphic shows a little bit about how the tumblers interact with the gears. Um, you can see the large and small cutouts, and that again corresponds to the shapes on the tumblers themselves, allowing them to rest in. You can also see how the gears interact with the rack, and since the rack is fixed, how that would move the entire mechanism laterally. This graphic shows how the authenticated and unauthenticated position interacts with the tumblers and the gears. You see those small and large protrusions on the tumblers, and then in the authenticated position you don't see them because they're nested into the gear packs. 
That's what happens when you push the key forward. Everything nests together, allowing the lock to turn. Those small protrusions are almost false protrusions, and they prevent you from tensioning the lock. They will, they will rest into the gear if you put tension on it, preventing everything from moving. Michael has gone into great depth on the keying system and how it works, and what he's found is that we have three possible lateral movements and seven possible rotational angles to the little triangular shape. That gives us theoretical key space of 21 to the power of 6, but more realistically, since you can't have extreme cuts right next to each other on the key, more realistically, there's about 11 million key variations, and that's what Fichette has, has advertised. So, putting it all together, we can key off of this little notch here. Obviously, that corresponds to the groove. Put the key in, and now any key will go into this step but only the appropriate key will actually allow you to push it all the way forward, settling those notches in the tumblers into their corresponding gates in the gears, finally engaging the tailpiece into the rotating lock mechanism and allow the whole thing to turn. Interestingly, this will turn independently of the lock, but when the key goes in, it, it doesn't turn the tailpiece. Um, when the key goes in, it interfaces with the tailpiece and then locks these two things together, allowing this to turn. So the, I actually thought that was an exploit at first, how you could just maybe reach in there and manually turn this. But it's uh, you, need to, you need to rotate the tailpiece in order for that to rotate. Uh, and that's all you can access from here. So Anyway, uh, just a really cool, really fascinating lock. I hope you've enjoyed this. That's about it for the Fichette F3D in a nutshell. I wish I could have taken it apart for you. But I want to thank Michael L. Hubler for his excellent, excellent paper and also for l giving me permission to use some of his graphics and drawings. Um, he's done an amazing job with that, and I would definitely suggest reading it. It goes into great detail on keys, the keying system, uh, the key space, and then also the numbers on his drawings have been cross-referenced with the numbers on the patent drawings. So it's easy to go between those things and cross-reference them. So I hope you've enjoyed this and I thank you for watching.